Hello, it's Amanda here from Suddenly Autistic and in this video I want to do a reaction video really to a video I saw yesterday and that triggered me I like explaining what that means and it was from um, a psychiatrist that I watch and really enjoy he's a trainee psychiatrist Dr Sill and um, the video was very good and I think um, but it was also sorry the video was very good it made in as much as it made a big impact the impact it made on me was that I felt triggered feeling triggered is when for me is when I get that sinking drop to the floor feeling as if somebody is punched me in the gut, gunned me down or whatever. It's it's a um, primal fear activated, a life and death situation activated. So that's what happened and I just want to explain that a little bit now that I've had a chance to calm down. So I was diagnosed with autism um, a couple of years ago and uh, before that about a year and a half prior to that I had my I received an ADHD diagnosis. Um, at the time of receiving my autism diagnosis, I was also confirmed as having complex PTSD and generalised anxiety disorder. Since then, so it's been a good two years now, um, I have been um, looked after by, I'm on to my second psychiatrist, my first one retired, but um, that's that's been a, a fairly supportive journey. I'm extremely I don't want to say I'm lucky because, you know, this shouldn't be about luck or privileged. I'm privileged. It is a privilege. It shouldn't be about luck um, to actually have this level of mental health support at the moment. And when I say this level, I, I, this is not free. I pay and I pay a lot of money because my psychiatrist is private. Um, however, just being able to access somebody for one's mental health and medication because you need a psychiatrist for certain medications here in Australia that has been very important and, I, and, and an important part of my my journey to healing the mental illness which is two of the diagnosis and accepting and integrating very important the neurodiversity into my sense of self the psychiatrist plays the smallest role in that in a day-to-day -day basis but in accepting confirming and validating the diagnosis and holding space for this new me that can't be underestimated absolutely not because they in Australia have the power to say well actually no I don't think you are that I think you're this and that can change everything so I want to talk about this reaction video understanding and having it out there that a psychiatrist or mental health professionals in a hospital scenario which is where Dr Sill is working at the moment so when you're hospitalized either voluntary or involuntary your 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 power is diminished so you are in a vulnerable situation either through your acute mental health problems your chronic mental health situation and or diagnosis your neurodiversity um, could be as simple or as complicated as just the level of energy and resilience you have at that time. So basically I want us to remember through this reaction video and for Dr. Sill to remember that there's a power dynamic at play in these relationships that is not equal. It is just not equal. I also want um, to draw um, attention to the fact that there are power dynamics at play in every relationship we enter into in life. Um, there is an inequality or an unequal, in, unequal share of power in different dynamics that's either perceived or actual. It might be parent to child or, 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 or young person to older, you know, to, to older person. It might be professional to um, lay person, it might be a language difference, it might be about race, about gender, about um, education um, levels or understanding, it could be about anything really, lots and lots of different things. So, and that does affect everything. I mean, there must be times, there probably be times when you, all of us, I mean, I certainly can, can remember when we didn't feel that we, like that we felt like the David in the David and Goliath 
scenario. I was going to say video, but it's a Bible story. <laughs> there wasn't videos then. Maybe, whatever, it doesn't matter. But anyway, so reacting to Dr. Sill. Dr. Sill is great. I really appreciate the videos he puts out. He clearly thinks very deeply about them and he's very passionate about his psychiatry training program and about his desire to become a psychiatrist. This video triggered me because he said a couple of things that are on my special interest radar. I am not a mental health professional. I am somebody who is actually at the moment mentally ill. So that I do not feel that gives me the right to question anybody else. So I'm not questioning Dr. Sill's perspective. I am reacting to how his video made me feel and hopefully explaining myself and putting it out there, this perspective as if I'm the patient. So Dr. Sill starts off by talking about um, the complexity. The, the video is called The Complexity of Psychiatric Diagnosis, and it is a com complex situation for sure. In my experience, um, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of data, um, narrative, and observation to work out what's going on for somebody. And the somebody in my case was me. So it, the process of receiving a diagnosis did not happen in one sitting. In fact, if it had, it would have been probably wrong, I would have guessed, unless it was then informed by other previous data and observations. So the whole process for me of getting diagnosed and then having a diagnosis confirmed took many, many months, um, actually over a year, because even with the psychiatrist taking on board what had been said before in the evaluations from the psychologist and clinical psychology um, testing etc then there was a period of time for, for them to get to know me before um, in this case there was medication for my ADHD that was trialed and then come back and then it's like oh okay yes I agree with the diagnosis this is what we'll try for you this is what we'll do for you so this is definitely not something that is easily a diagnosis in my experience was not just handed out absolutely not absolutely not Anyway, so there's that. Dr. Sill starts off by, um, by um, saying the fundamental problem, he talks about fundamental problems in different sciences, and he talks about the fundamental, the fundamental problem of consciousness is marrying the subjective with the objective. This is complete, this is, um, um, I'm gonna lose my words, this is philosophy, so, this is, I think, therefore I am. This is who am I territory. This is what makes us human territory. So we have this consciousness. We have our subjective, how we perceive and interact with our conscious self. And then the objective, which can be measured and um, observed, I guess, from a third person or from, or as a person in the world. So it might be me objectively assessing say the weather is raining so there's rain it's dull it's a certain temperature that's an objective measure the subjective would be I feel a little bit uncomfortable that the raindrops are falling down my back or that you know my toes are colder than my heels right now and that's a little bit interesting as a sensation or this hand feels different to this hand you know they're the feeling element is subjective. We could perhaps measure those and find an objective reality that marries with that. It might be that this hand is colder than that hand or whatever. You know, there could be reasons to explain it in the, in the objective realm. Dr. Sill then goes on to say the fundamental problem of, um, um, of psychiatry. Psychiatry has a, um, an imperfect, oh, hang on, I've missed a bit. So when Dr. Sill talks about consciousness, subjective with objective, what he then goes on to say is it's marrying up perception, what we perceive, with neural activity. This is what neuroscience is all about. And I have read quite a few scientific papers on neuroscience and although I am a scientist, a consultant chemist, I doubt, I don't think that makes me qualified to give commentary on neuroscience. However, what it 
does mean is that I am aware of this fundamental problem that is trying to be explained by neuroscience. So looking at the brain to explain how we perceive the world. And I know enough to know that it is very complicated and that if we focus just on neuron activity and firing, it seems not to be that easy to work out and to map. It's not impossible. People have tried it. There are papers out there. But it's, it doesn't seem as simple as that. We're missing all the other signals that we get, the rest of the body, the rest of the intangible, the unmappable things, or the difficult things like um, not unmappable or intangible, but relationships. Relationships matter. That's all I'd say. Well, that's the last thing I'd say on that after rambling for a bit. Dr. Sill goes on to say in psychiatry, the fundamental problem is the imperfect way of diagnosing people. It's about taking the subjective report of the patient and then the objective observations of the psychiatrist and trying to establish a, a, an explanation, trying to find an explanation for the patterns. In simple terms, this is me as a patient going in and saying, I feel this, I feel that, I experience that, this doesn't make sense, this hurts, I don't like this, this really makes me uncomfortable, I don't know why I have to sleep so long after doing this. So giving that kind of narrative and peppering it with some observations and some, some, you know, some, some focal points, I suppose, and then having a psychiatrist um, with experience of hearing about this, observing the behaviour, the maybe the eye contact that I might be given, the mannerisms, in the, the tonality of my speech, the way I'm put together as my, how I dress, the way I move around the place, my experience of doing things like, am I, experience, am I reporting that I'm having problems with digestion and sleep? Am I reporting that my libido is low? Am I reporting that I'm clumsy? You know, what am I reporting? So they take all of this into consideration along with whatever else they've got and make a diagnosis. So the long and the short of it is that Dr. Seal is recognising he's working within a field of science where there's still a lot of um, subjective reality guiding the diagnosis. And the feeling that I'm getting and through you know, some of the words that he's saying is that he would feel that it was more scientific or a bit more robust, and this might be me projecting, if there was a lot more objective reality to the diagnostic process. Um, if that's the case for Dr. Sill, then I would say that I don't think he's ever going to find the comfort that he's seeking, potentially, that I'm perceiving he's seeking through objective measures because humans are irrational. We are also wired for perception. There are Our brain has been understood and mapped to be designed to work on perception, which I've talked about and, and demonstrated, well, demonstrated, I've highlighted in other videos I've made. But basically, it goes like this scenario. There's no good in our lives going, we, we have to be risk averse. And to be risk averse is to assess situations before they've happened, to have a level of anxiety, if you like, and then adjust our behavior. So it's no good just walking out your home and crossing the road and hoping for the best. We generally are wired for perception. So we perceive a risk in crossing the road and then we adjust our behavior accordingly. And we will take in lots of information and data to make an assessment of when it's right to cross the road. In the days before, roads and traffic accidents and whatever, they would have been bears in the forest. You know, so we are wired for perception. We remember the threat. We remember certain things. And these are somatic. So we might remember the smell in the air. We might remember the, um, the sound of the crunching of leaves or just the atmosphere. Like the, everything had gone a little weird. Like maybe the birds had ran off, ran off, flow off, flown off. And we could perceive a change in the soundscape or just the, the tension. You know how you can sometimes feel that tension humans our human ancestors would have read those signs consciously and subconsciously and responded or been cautious because there might have been a bear or a wolf or something else around or a snake whatever it might be so we're wired to act on perception and perception doesn't always follow into objective reality we can avoid a bear that's not there we can fight a bear that's not there. That would be psychosis.
So I, I found that interesting. And the reason that triggered me is because that sort of triggered me or, or activated me. So that was a glimmer. So when Dr. Sill started talking about this, I started to get a glimmer. Oh, that's good. Keywords. He's tapped into one of my special interests, consciousness, psycho not psychology, <sighs> philosophy, philosophy. Who are we? Why are we here? What are we doing with our lives? Why am I sitting in the rain recording a video? That kind of thing. Dr. Sill explained the diagnosis change over time and he explained um, that some diagnoses are easier to get, a, get, get to than others. Um, he also explained that having a diagnosis is great in as much as it's a quick communication tool between professionals. It's good to access, it's essential for accessing medication, funding and support. It also is useful for the, for the individual involved at the other end of the diagnosis to help explain the inner turmoil and distress. I wanted to draw a line under that because this is what Dr. Sill was focusing on because he's working in a hospital as a psychiatric intern, whatever you call it trainee, I don't know what you call it, but anyway, on a psychiatric learning program. I wanted to interject there and say that a diagnosis, understanding that from a patient's perspective, is also helping as a communication tool. If I can explain, ah, I am autistic, so if you're noticing me not wanting to do that or doing that or behaving in this way, I am autistic, that's a heads up. This is not using my diagnosis as an excuse, and we do come to that later, that's where I was triggered. This is me passing on some interesting, useful communication points that can shortcut a long explanation. Well, actually, I don't want you to hug me because, I, you know, hugging makes me feel a bit, ooh, and, I, you know, I don't want to... It's an awkward conversation. I don't like hugs. If I can explain to people ahead of time, look, I'm autistic, I'm not really a hugger, it's, you know, I have sensory issues around that. Usually people will be like, oh, oh yeah, okay. And it starts a different conversation than if you just say, don't hug me under any circumstances, do not hug me. Or even, please don't hug me. Whatever, you know, all those ways you could say, just don't touch. My hair is really annoying me. It's so bad. It's not greasy. It's bloody wet because of the rain. Oh, I hate hair. Ooh, it's so annoying. <sighs> anyway. Dr. Sill then gets to the part that triggers me. This is where he is, and I can see that he's made this video because he's had, I, I mean, look, this is me projecting. I'm projecting the fact that he's made this video because life's been shit. <laughs> Work has been terrible. He keeps getting abused and people are saying, oh, sorry, doctor, it wasn't me. It was my diagnosis. I can't help it. I can't do that program that you want me to do. Oh, no, that doesn't work for me because I'm this, that and the other. Maybe that's what happened. I don't know. I can believe that's what's happened because I've certainly, I live in the world and I've seen people talk in that way. And what, in a nutshell, or wrapping that up nice and neatly with a Christmas bow, um, that's where the diagnosis becomes the excuse. So what he's talking about is that how I was triggered is that he doesn't, it's a, it's a fine line. There's a fine line. And I was triggered because he's going to be and already is in a position of power over the individual. Individuals, when they're lacking power, will use anything in their, in, their, in their power to avoid more pain. If you're in hospital or seeking help for psychiatric services, you're likely already in pain. You're possibly already chronically invalidated. You might be struggling to come to terms with or even understanding what you can and can't do what you should and shouldn't be leaning into and out of, how, how to set boundaries and expectations. So these are all big questions, whether you're a seeker or a avoider, whether you're looking for an excuse or not. People who use a diagnosis as an excuse may be that kind of person they might be always looking for an excuse and they might be delighted that now they've got like a whole list well I can't do anything now I've just got to sit here and whatever but the majority of people won't be like that the people who are like that would have been like that without the diagnosis the people who get a diagnosis and are then saying well I can't do that because I'm autistic or that's hard because of you know that doesn't work for me because that's different anyway I think I'm rambling there and getting already in a loop 
So Dr. Sill basically gives an example then that um, he knows a story about, he might have been there himself, I don't really, I didn't really get the gist of that. But anyway, young person comes in, goes through a process, so undiagnosed young person having some problems, sees the doctor on you know, Monday, Tuesday, goes away on Wednesday, comes back on Thursday, and there's a diagnosis of autism. Then a few months later, the person comes back and says, oh my gosh, you know, getting that diagnosis was worse thing in my world. It's really changed my life. I can't live anymore. This is terrible. I hate it. Everything's terrible. You know, it's changed everything. Dr. Sill in that moment was saying things, was saying to us in the video where he was explaining to the person who had this diagnosis, well, look, you were the same person on Monday as you were on Thursday after the diagnosis. So pre and post diagnosis, you're objectively the same person. Nothing has changed in your subjective experience of reality and your ability to engage in the world. And I got the feeling that Dr. Sill was saying this out loud again to wrestling with what he was saying and actually trying to seek either some validation or put it out there as this is right isn't it or or understanding that this he was right <clears throat> when I actually feel he's very wrong getting a diagnosis changes our subjective and objective reality around everything around it's all about relationships again humans work on relationships how we feel about ourselves affects and informs how we observe the world and experience the world objectively. If I suddenly develop a massive pain in my leg after running and I don't know what it is, there's a lot of anxiety there. That anxiety could take me in a lot of places because anxiety is, is basically like, well, it could be this, it could be that. It's a big, big problem. I could have a massive amount of fear and be disabled by that anxiety. If I then go to the hospital and get an x-ray because I really think I've broken my leg and the x-ray comes back and says I haven't broken my leg, my anxiety levels will go down because maybe that was my big fear that actually I broke my leg. Um, and having that validation means that now the pain is different. I can interpret the pain differently. It will be because that was my biggest fear. Maybe then I have an ultrasound and find that there's a little bit of bruising, but no ligament damage so my elevation um, of anxiety goes down again and so on and so forth so all I need to do is and I mean you know this is a funny scenario but all I need to do is go home rest ice you know rice rice eat some rice basically that's all I need to do rest ice elevation what's the c for compression no confusion diagnosis changes everything for us as individuals, it's a level, it's a source of power for a person who has been chronically invalidated, had their narrative, which is a big thing for Dr. Sill, had their narrative twisted by other people who filled in the blanks for them, or having the person fill in the blanks with their negative self-talk. So there's never a vacuum. Nature doesn't give us a vacuum. So we come into this world, we start to develop our sense of selves. We are, we subjectively experience the world as a little bit abrasive and why are people reacting to me like that why can't I do things like other people and we try and explain it we diagnose ourselves or we have other people place diagnosis on us she's a nice easy going girl oh she's very obliging she's extremely capable she's a pain in the ass she's a crybaby she's overly emotional she's a tough thing with no emotions she's go-getter she's a little bit you know unpredictable don't go near her on a Tuesday you know whatever it is whether it's other people or whether it's us there will be no vacuum we are evaluated every day and I think that what triggered me in the bad way made me feel like I was going to die basically is when Dr. Sill is saying well you're the same person that is not true that is not true. If I could give him, as a patient, if I could give him any advice, it would be do not say that under any circumstances to anyone. So there was that. Back to the why the um, using our diagnosis or, or saying things that make out that we are trying to basically use our, use our diagnosis as an excuse. 
Dr. Seal does at minute 10 talk about external locus of control and saying that the diagnostic process is a way of externalizing what's going on subjectively. And in that case, it's in danger of, of othering or putting part of ourself outside of our control. Oh, well, I can't do it because of this, you know, that kind of thing. I disagree with that too. And I think that's a very externalizing way of looking at the diagnosis and it fails to appreciate the embodied reality of people who need and seek and thrive with a diagnosis. So I would just encourage Dr. Sill to think, put himself in the shoes and find a place where maybe he has sought some external validation of his reality, whether it was whatever it was, you know, where has he felt like an alien, like nobody understands him and then had some external validation. It might even be as simple as, you know, there's Vegemite in Australia and some people love it, some people hate it. If you were in a community where everyone hated Vegemite and you loved it, you'd think, why am I eating this crap? What is it about this crap? Is it bad for me? What am I, why am I wrong? That's an invalidating environment. Whereas if you go down the road to the village where everybody loves Vegemite, you'll be like, oh my gosh, I found my people. Dr. Seal will have had that experience, I'm sure. At, at minute 10, he goes on, he says, the fundamental role of psychotherapy is, to, is the assumption of a responsibility. And this is where, again, I think it's quite telling that maybe Dr. Seal had had a bad week or had people being rude and abusive and resistant to what he was trying to do, which is perfectly human, especially in a hospital situation. And I understand what he's saying. There is... Let's go back. To, let's get back to this. I think what he was trying to do, what, uh, well, what I perceived him as trying to do is to go back to control and saying, whoa, no, you have control, you know, don't give your control to the diagnosis. I can tell you now that as somebody with a psychiatric um, diagnosis well, with, with mental illness and with also neurodiversity, there is no part of me ever that wants to give over the only thing we have in life as humans that's my freedom freedom is huge it's a core value of mine I value my freedom my freedom means accepting myself ultimately and the level of control I do or do not have at any one level of time being mentally ill means my level of control over my very self over my thoughts I think therefore I am well I don't know I can't I have a temporary loss of capacity or reduction in capacity to control my thoughts and how my brain directs my body not in a psychotic way I don't lose touch with reality I just find reality really really hard during those times in a way that is extremely disabling not just a little bit awful a little bit uncomfortable I live with a little bit uncomfortable I live with excruciating sometimes as many people with diagnosis of different things physical and mental pain do so to have a psychiatrist to then say oh well you know this won't work if you don't assume responsibility for yourself and stop blaming your diagnosis that's completely invalidating you've lost the person you, they have lost respect for you at that time because that's lazy so I just wanted to put that back on Dr. Seal because it's wrong that does not excuse rude behavior and Dr. Seal does go on to say that so there is I might have awkward behavior with someone who's autistic it doesn't mean that I can walk around being rude and saying you know there's some people pride themselves in having no filter and saying oh yeah you do your your ass does look fat in that dress Karen or you know what's wrong with you you look really old today you know that I could say those sort of things just as a human as somebody I could blame my autism for that but I know that's the wrong thing to do if somebody asks me a question do you think I look old today and I am actually you know I might say well yeah actually you do look a bit more a bit older a bit tireder and run down than usual that would be my autism making me be honest but I have manners I have values I can understand other people's perspective. I'm not just going to blurt it out. Again, I'm waffling. Dr. Seal was basically, I think what he's done is he's made a quantum leap. His brain's tried to intellectualize away his distress. 
it's distressing working in a mental health environment because people will lean on their diagnosis and it's really hard I think for mental health professionals to know when to hold them fold them walk away I guarantee that a lot of them are very good at that probably better than what I'm making out here but what I would say is that I don't think many people are lazy when they're calling or leaning on their mental oh sorry I was rude to you but it's my mental illness it might be back to the power dynamic that it's a it's a it's an attempt a clumsy and inappropriate and not very helpful attempt to gain a little bit of power back in that dynamic if people are constantly reacting like that to an individual psychiatrist or mental health professional it might be a sign that their approach is a little bit too strong a little bit too dominating a little bit too I'll tell you I know better at the end of the day I think no matter how we are it's really important for mental health professionals to hold in mind that the they will never know the individual as well as they have the potential to know themselves and I say that because they the individual might not know themselves very well at that point point but they will on some level subconscious or otherwise know how they feel and that's where that's coming from. I feel like I've talked a lot, probably way too much. Basically, that's what I was going to say, that um, I get triggered still and feel, I still feel it. I'm, I'm actually feeling, as I'm saying those words in my heart, it's actually feeling really like a stab in the heart and then it goes and sinks into my stomach like a sinking feeling when I remember that people... When I tell people I'm autistic, there'll be a certain proportion of the population that will go, oh, yeah, so that's your excuse, is it? Huh, what are you trying to get out of? Do you just not want to do it? Oh, you just can't be bothered to be nice. You just don't like being social, do you? You really just don't want to do that. There will always be that I can't control. That's what I can't control. But that isn't neutral. My subjective experience of the world of that is... is, is that is awful. That is pain. There's pain every time in that. So what I'd say to Dr. Silly is receiving a diagnosis is empowering, but it also is a lens on how invalidating, upsetting and distressing the world really is because the world does not, as a general rule, like people to think they're special, even if they have special needs different needs whatever way you want to say that or whatever way makes sense to you if you try and distance yourself create a little little um pocket for yourself that's outside the norm somebody will try and rip your balls off i don't even have balls but they'll try and rip them off because that's what people do so having a diagnosis changes everything it changes how you relate to yourself it changes how you relate to other people if our subjective reality changes our objective reality changes are we ever going to be able to map all of that in our neural activity i doubt it would we be able to map it if we took time to look at how to evaluate more holistically probably so how we relate to others how we relate to ourselves the narratives we tell the, the, how we hold power and boundaries, how we attempt to bridge a, a power imbalance, what strategies do we use, what's our heart rate as well as our neural activity. There are objective and subjective measures, but I just think that's what I wanted to say. Um, I hope that's helpful. I kind of feel like I've understood it a bit better now. I made a video yesterday, but I, it's it's just... It came from a from a dysregulated place and it wasn't like crazy or anything. Not that that's a problem, but it was just not as valuable to me as this one. And yes, I do look older and tired today because I've got up, just done this in the rain. So now I'm like ugh, rain headed and I couldn't even find my glasses, let alone put makeup on. Not that that matters either, but I am feeling quite good today. So yay, hey today.